good evening. Look up into the southeast, fairly late on, and there you will see the red planet Mars shining down from among the faint stars in Aquarius. And now, brighter than any other body in the sky, apart from the Sun, the Moon and Venus. And in August, it will be as close to us as it can ever be, less than 35 million miles. Here's Mars as seen through a telescope. Here are the polar caps, now known to be made up of water ice. The red dust deserts and those dark areas where the red dust deserts have been blown away by winds in the thin Martian atmosphere. And Mars is less unlike the Earth than any other world we know. Smaller than we are, further from the sun and colder, but not too dissimilar. And can there be life there? That's what we want to find out, and I think soon we'll do so. No Martians, I'm afraid, but there could be life of some kind. And now to join me, three old friends of the sky at night, Professor Gary Hunt, Professor Colin Pinninger, and Dr. Monica Grady. Welcome back. First thoughts, Gary, the atmosphere, you're a meteorist. It's an exciting place, a very thin atmosphere. It's a, the surface pressure is about thousands that we have on the Earth, so it's a very low pressure situation, carbon dioxide. But that shouldn't fool you. We have a lot of dust whirling around. And yes, while dust is ubiquitous over the surface, it gets whipped up into small dust devils. Some of them can cover the entire planet. I remember that when Mariner 9 went in, I was dispatched to South Africa to look at it, and I couldn't see anything at all. Well, that was the great surprise for that mission. But also there's some interesting cloud formations which are attractive in their own sense, particularly around the polar regions. We see a lot of cyclonic clouds. But that's telling you it's redistributing uh, the moisture and the material. But the, ap the atmospheric situation, indeed the metrology, um, has very strong variations according to the sun. So we can get warm by Martian standards, like we have during this summer, about 27 Celsius, and it can get extremely cold as well. So very rapid diurnal variations, interesting weather systems which are important for the way the surface uh, has weathered over this time. And of course the geology is fascinating too, isn't it? Oh yes, yes. I mean, the, the rock formations that we've seen from a lot of the images from, from Mariner 9, from um, Mars Global Surveyor, show huge formations in terms of volcanoes, rift valleys, possible river valleys, possible glacial channels, layered terrains, craters, of course, covering the whole of the surface of Mars, a, a huge variation in rock forms. Yes, you say uh, old riverbeds. Um, water? Must have had water on Mars once on the surface? Yeah, possibly riverbeds, possibly glaciers. Some of them will be lava channels. We, we don't really know completely. Each time a mission goes there, we get new information leading to new interpretations. Underground water? What do you think, Colin? I think uh, maybe nearer to the surface than you imagine. Uh, there are new results that suggest that uh, probes from orbiters are detecting uh, hydrogen. So... Uh, there may very well be permafrost that uh, we can analyse. And, of course, when Mars Express goes there with, uh, yes. with radar that can go to a couple of kilometres, we may be able to answer this. And, of course, if there is water fairly near the surface, well, what about life? Of course, there's somebody well, think we've found it. What do you think of that, Malika? Mars well, and meteorites? Well, certainly we've got uh, dozens of rocks that have come from Mars, and one of which was identified as having a tiny little fossil inside it. How certain are you that it comes from Mars? Oh, we can be very certain that the rocks come from Mars. They've got gases trapped in them which have an identical composition to the Martian atmosphere. And in one of the rocks, a rock called Allen Hills 84001, yeah, yes. it's got little features inside the salts. It's a rock which is igneous, it's come from a magma, so it was very hot and it solidified. And that's not the sort of rock you'd expect to find fossils in. But it's had water running through it from when it was on the surface of Mars. Um, and so the, this water that's run through it has deposited patches of a mineral called carbonate. And these, when you look at them under the microscope, they're bright orange. They stand out like, like rosettes and they're, they're really a very vivid colour. And uh, in some of these rosettes, um, little structures have been found which look as if they're fossilised, a bit like fossilised worms, actually. We, so we tiny, really shouldn't get hung up thing. on this one meteorite. No, no, no. no the I unfortunate mean, thing about this meteorite is it's an extremely old rock. Yeah, I mean, it's... And that means that uh, who, who knows what it's actually telling us about recent events on Mars. It's there are ex more exciting Martian meteorites. They're probably near, nearer to 30 now than... Uh, the dozen that there were when 84001 was The thing discovered. about 84001, though, is, as Colin said, it's very old. 
it's very unusual it's got these structures in it it tells us a lot about the geology of Mars and the processes that have been going on on the surface of Mars it's very different from any of the of the other Martian rocks there's another group of Martian rocks which have got similar sort of carbonates in them don't have structures in them but the thing about uh, not just ALH but most of the other rocks from Mars is they've got different forms of carbon in as well. They've got mm. organic carbon as well as the carbonates, some of which is terrestrial contamination, there's another, some of which there's is another definitely rock, Martian. There's another rock called 79001, which is not so well known, which has samples in it, which has possibly as much as 5,000 parts per million of carbon as carbonate and organic matter. That is a very high number to equate with contamination on Earth particularly because it's selective. It's only parts of the meteorite that have these features. Not The whole meteorite, if it was contaminated, you'd expect to see it uniformly contaminated. So the fact that you have these very, very tight pockets within it that look to all intents and purposes on Earth, if a geologist found them on Earth, they'd practically describe them as a petroleum source rock. You know, seriously, the petroleum source rocks are only a little bit more than that. In so, you are, so you are saying that we have found life from Mars? No, no I'm saying we no. have found on Mars, we have found evidence that all the, all the environmental features that one requires for life are in existence and can be demonstrably shown to have occurred on Mars. We do have associated with some of those features things that on Earth would be taken as evidence of life. But because this is such an emotive subject, no one is going to put their hand on their heart and say, this is Martian, because we just do not have the evidence to say we are 110% sure. And we really do need to be 110% sure. We found organic carbon in these Martian meteorites. We cannot say we have found biogenic carbon. And we, to eliminate the terrestrial contamination issue, we have to go to Mars and make the measurements on Mars, which is what Beagle 2 is going to do. Most of what we know about Mars has been gained by space research methods, beginning with the Mariners in the 1960s. Mariner 2 flew past Mars and sent back the first really useful information, showed that the atmosphere is much thinner than we thought, and there were craters there. Then came Mariners 6, 7, and 8, which went around Mars. And Mars turned out to be not the kind of world we expected. No lush green vegetation, in fact, a world of mountains, valleys, and craters. And then, with Melon and I, we had the first really good views of these amazing formations. We've covered them, all these developments on the sky at night over the years. And here's an extract from a very early program. Seems rather quaint now. Evening. We've just had some amazing photographs sent back by the American probe to Mars, Mariner 6. Uh, Mariner 7, by the way, has been brought back under control, and we await news from that. But meanwhile, we have this superb series of close-ups from Mariner 6, and I'd like to show you those pictures now, beginning with Mars, as seen by Mariner, from a distance of more than 700,000 miles, which, of course, is a great deal further than the Moon is from the Earth. And even so, you can see there some of the dark areas, which may be vegetation, and at the bottom, you can see the white polar cap, which has always been thought to be due to some kind of icy or frosty deposit. But when Mariner went past Mars at only about 2,000 miles, we got the really spectacular pictures. And just look at that. Craters on Mars, very similar to those of the Moon. And the largest crater on that picture is about 160 miles across. And remember, when Mariner took that picture, it was only about as far from the surface of Mars as we are from Moscow. And I wonder how those craters got there. What are they? Are they due to things hitting Mars, or are they volcanic? I believe myself that most of them are likely to be volcanic, but I remain to be proved wrong. And let me show you now the most spectacular of all these pictures sent back so far by Mariner 6. And just look at that. It's a crater 24 miles in diameter, seen from 2,000 miles. And just to give you an idea of scale, the area covered in that picture is about 63 miles by 48 miles. And I think you'll agree that that crater on Mars is very similar to a crater on the Moon. Much new information came from the Viking missions. And the Vikings actually landed on Mars and sent back the first pictures direct from the surface. 
and extraordinarily good they were too. They searched for life. They didn't find it. Some of the results were decidedly puzzling, but there was no evidence of any Martian life. Well, Mars continues to provide us with plenty of surprises. Both the Viking landers are now operating on the surface, and some of the information they've sent back, even during the last day or two, is absolutely unexpected. Well, these are undoubtedly the best pictures yet from orbit. But in addition to the Great Canyons, we have these things that look so remarkably like dry riverbeds. And some of those are in the area of Chrysi, where Viking 1 actually came down. What do you make of that, Gary? Well, certainly to me, it looks like a river flowing from the right to the left. And we know that the Chrysi Valley goes downhill towards the left-hand side. And this perhaps did carry water at some past epoch on Mars. I think all the evidence is fitting together. This is, these are old water channels, but the quantities of water must have been enormous, and where they've come from and where they've gone to is still a mystery. Then came the Pathfinder probe. This time it landed and bounced. And from there came what we call now the Sagan Memorial Station and the Sodrana probe, which moved around analyzing the rocks and still looking for signs of life. Since then, we've had Mars Global Surveyor, which is going around Mars even now and sending back pictures, and the Odyssey probe, which has shown that the polar caps really are water ice, and there's plenty of ice there under the surface, which was going to be amazingly useful for future colonists. This year, we had three new, very important probes. The European Mars Express, which has taken their Beagle 2, which will land on Christmas Day, and America's Spirit and Opportunity, two probes taking their Mars rovers and they'll crawl down and look for signs of water and signs of life. And they will land on Mars next January. So by this time next year, we should know a great deal more than we know now. Colin, we know that Beagle 2 is going to land on Mars on Christmas Day. How is it going to work and what do you hope it's going to tell us? Well, in the first instance, we'll have to stabilise the spacecraft and make sure that we're in a position to keep it alive for the whole of the mission. And because there's so little power generated, then we really need to be aiming that this spacecraft will last for months rather than a few hours or a few days. How do you select the area? Is it this radio? The, the area was selected on both engineering and science grounds. To talk about the science first, the science is that uh, it's a place on Mars which is obviously has a diverse series of rocks on it, it probably contains material which has been rock washed down off the southern highlands, so potentially there's a, a lot of material of different sources there. It must be some kind of sedimentary infill place. It's the sort of place where we know that there must be volatiles in water because we can actually see volat uh, volcanic features of different age. Now that means it's a good place to go searching for life because potentially the water is there. One of the first things that Beagle is intending to do is to answer this question, are there carbonates there? Yeah. Because carbonates are the places on Earth where you find the features left from previous life. You find the residue of the, the organisms that lived in the water or the debris that the water washed into the formation which was incorporated in the, in the rock as it solidified. So that's what Beagle's after. It's going to go for a rock and trying to drill into it and get some pristine material from the inside to analyse. How far down can you drill? Uh, into a rock we can take off the surface and we can then go in about a centimetre to get a core out. When we're talking about getting into the soil, one of the things you don't want to do is to get into a place where the wind has just simply turned the soil yeah. over. So that's the ambition of Beagle, is to get into a place where the soil hasn't been turned over. And that's the reason why we have this little mole, crawls across the surface, burrows under the biggest rock it can find. But the winds on Mars are well, quite, quite appreciable. Well, the, the, wind, the winds can be moving up to several miles an hour, and apparently very strong, but they're moving dust around all the time. This is one of the things we should also take into consideration in actually choosing the sites. We want the safe landing site, as Colin has said. We've got to make sure it's flat, because remember it's a bouncing ball technique, so we don't want the thing bouncing around all over the place. And it's not going to be the only around too many large rocks that are going to affect the, the way the, uh, the landing craft are going to operate. And also, the other point to bear in mind about the, the surface dust, it is there, and it could easily get whipped up. So we don't want to be in an area which is over-dusty either. Yeah. So all these things have got to be taken into consideration. So a lot of thought is going into landing on the surface, but these winds will be changing during the day. 
And the other part, with the, with the other surface uh, experiments we'll be noticing is that they've got a few hours during the day in which to carry out their observations, then analyze it, and then decide what to do the next day. So there's a very small period of we work actually, in. We actually carry, uh, as well as doing science, we carry a suite of environmental sensors, yes. which are there purely for these engineering reasons that Gary's mentioned. We need to understand the temperature, the pressure, the wind speed, the flux of the sun at the site, so that we can actually run the spacecraft mm. on top of just doing the experiments. But of course the atmosphere is so thin the winds can't have very much force. Well they may have very much force but it can whirl the dust oh, around yes, and yeah. you can imagine if you've got instruments there which are solar driven and the dust gets onto solar solar yeah. panels that's going to cut down their usefulness and how much they can mm. be used. Nightmares. Mm. So that, that is a situation which really must be terrifying Colin and everybody else uh, that we've got to worry about. So yes we, we, we're dying to get some good results and hope that the environment doesn't get too turbulent and cause additional problems. Can we come now to the most important question of all I think? The question of life on Mars. We're talking about life there. We know there are no Martians. Nothing so advanced as an earwig or even a blade of grass. So what kind of life do you expect, if there's any at all? What do you think about that, Monica? Well, I think if there's anything there, it's going to be a very simple sort of life form. I don't use the term primitive, but I use simple. Uh, we have analogies on Earth of the type of um, colonies of microorganisms that live inside rocks in Antarctica. They live just in the surface millimetres of the rocks. They're protected from solar radiation. They're protected from extremes of temperature. It could be something like that, actually living in the rock, living in cracks of the rock. What we now know about life on Earth, of course, is we didn't know 20 odd years ago. Or even two. Is, <laughs> is that... Uh, and, you know, is that things can survive in very extreme mm. environments. Mm. Life doesn't seem to be too worried by cold at all. It doesn't seem to be affected by salt content. has no real worry about whether it's acidic or alkaline. It can survive up to temperatures that we probably, when we were kids, believed that everything was, was killed at. And uh, so there is every chance that there could be a niche on Mars where there was some kind of what we would call on Earth an extremophile. But I imagine that would be very simple because it would probably use the most easy way of getting its energy. Reduce carbon dioxide, of which there is an abundant supply, produce methane, that's what Beagle intends to do, analyse the atmosphere, see if there is a trace of methane in the atmosphere, because if there is, it shouldn't be there unless there's biology constantly producing it. Right. That biology may be thousands of miles away from where we land. I think it's worth also emphasising that we are looking at a very narrow belt of Mars. The, 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 the way the spacecraft have been set up and the way they were transmit, we can only work with in plus or minus 25 degrees of the equator. So we're only looking at a small area, three landing sites, and if we can make some small very definite steps, as Colin has suggested, that will be a terrific step forward. There's a lot of other places on the, on the planet we want to look at, particularly towards the polar mm. regions, mm. and that's got to yeah. be the missions of the future. Mm. We can start to move and roll around and actually explore the interface between the polar cap, which we know moves around quite a lot in size, yes. and, and obviously is mixed up with a lot of CO2 ice, as well as probably water ice and dust as well. But by looking at the atmosphere, you do look at the whole planet. Absolutely. So it's one thing we won't have inside are hydrothermal vents. After all, Mars does have a hot core, but it's um, smaller than ours. Well, I think the other thing about the interior of Mars, which relates back earlier, you raised the question about volcanism, yes. uh, the interior geology. Mars is, 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 has a very weak magnetic field. We are very confused about the interior of Mars, and trying to understand that is very important for us, not only from, from a planetary point of view, but also the feedback to, to the geology. And think, again, further than that, if we are going to send people to Mars uh, in the future and explore it, Mars is not protected by the magnetosphere yeah, as we yeah. are, and such things as solar flares, solar mm. storms, are all going to be very damaging, not only for the instruments, but any form of people or, or uh, habitation that we try to put there. So this, again, Honey. understanding our area is important. <laughs>